morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first of our Neuro Talks for 2021. My name is Carol Renouf. I'm the Executive Director of Neuro Foundation. And thank you very much for joining us. Just a little bit of housekeeping very quickly. We're gonna be holding three more of these sessions between now and November. We'll be sending you a follow-up email after this first one to alert you to the rest of the series and invite you to join us again and share the registration link. If you are in lockdown along with us, a special message that I hope you're coping, especially if you either live alone or are homeschooling. And I know we have supporters all around the country online with us today. I'm aiming to structure this session. So I have around 25 minutes discussion with our panelists, followed by around 15 or 20 minutes for you to ask questions. Now, please don't wait till I throw the floor open to post your questions in the Q&A feature. The chat box is disabled and please don't raise your virtual hand because that will distract me. Just use the Q&A along the way, although we won't pick up your questions until a little bit later in the piece. It is important, lastly, that I mention to you that we don't have any doctors on the panel today. So if you do have a clinical question about diagnosis, treatment or prognosis for yourself or a loved one, please note we're not equipped to answer it. Our theme for today is future leaders, which means that I am by far the least interesting person in this virtual room. The medical research world is a tough one in which to survive, not least because funding for research, typically secured through competitive government grants, is becoming increasingly difficult to obtain. And that's why your donations and support are so very important to us. Now I have the honor of introducing you to three of Neura's young guns who are not only surviving, but thriving. They're all in their thirties, chose neuroscience as their field of endeavor, have completed their doctorates and have done many years of study to get to where they are today. Let's find out more. So we'll go to Sophie first. Dr. Sophie Andrews originally hailed from Melbourne where she was working as a clinical neuropsychologist at the Alfred Hospital, seeing patients with neurodegenerative disease like Huntington's. She then joined Neuro from Monash University. Her husband is from Sydney. They have two young children and Sophie has recently returned from maternity leave. Sophie, so tell us what motivated you to move from clinical to research. Um, thanks, Carol. So um, I was working clinically, as you mentioned, um, at the Alfred and also Calvary Bethlehem, another hospital. It really specializes in progressive neurodegenerative diseases. So you mentioned Huntington's, also Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, and some early dementia. And part of my role would be to do a, an assess, a cognitive assessment, um, and then um, sit with patients and, fa and family members to talk about um, whether there'd been any cognitive decline, and if there had been, what kinds of um, strategies they might be able to use to compensate. Um, but I felt like I really wanted to do more because what patients and families really wanted was some kind of treatment or cure or something that they could be doing to perhaps slow that um, trajectory of the disease. Um, and I'd heard at the time that there was some promise in lifestyle, but it felt like there was still a lot of unanswered questions around that. So to do with what the underlying mechanisms were, what kinds of lifestyle changes might be most effective, what kind of dose um, you might need. And so I felt like I really wanted to contribute to answering those questions. Um, so that made, made the move over towards the research. Okay, so you took the, you took the plunge. So, so now you're focusing on, on dementia. Is that easier than Huntington's? So um, with Huntington's disease, it's a more um, specialised. So with Huntington's disease, it's a genetic um, neurodegenerative disease um, and it is an autosomal dominant. So if you have a parent with Huntington's, you have a 50-50 chance of actually inheriting the disease yourself. And there's actually a genetic test where someone at risk can take that test and find out if they're at risk for, for the disease. Um, and onset's generally midlife. So we have a, a sample of people who know that they 
will get the disease but are pre-symptomatic. And so you could really look, for example, in um, very specifically and whether interventions might be effective. Whereas dementia is a lot, there's a much more broad um, causes of dementia and people may be at risk, but they don't know whether or not they would actually get that disease. But dementia is a lot more common. Huntington's is rare. So you have a much larger sample of people and a potentially bigger impact too on a population level. So there's kind of advantages and, and um, for, for studying each. Um, yeah, de kind of dementia is a, a broader church in some ways, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I know now you have an interest in both the neuroscience and the neuropsychology of habit formation. Can you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah, sure. So just to backtrack a little. So when I first moved um, into research, I was focusing more on the mechanisms that underlie and I was particularly focusing on exercise. So looking at kind of the neuroplasticity effects of exercise on the brain. But there's a lot of research now that suggests that, for example, physical activity as a whole is really beneficial for, for the brain and, you know, of course, physically and mentally and cognitively. Um, but then the next question that occurred was really how um, can we help people to change behaviour? And, you know, there's a lot of interesting research now that's focusing on habits. And there's, there's been really good progress in the area of the neuroscience of understanding habits. So actually what's going on in the brain with neuroimaging research. And then there's other, there was other research looking at the behavioural, the psychological processes that are going on. Um, but in terms of how those actually um, integrate together, work together, and what other individual factors like personality and um, uh, psychological factors might impact on that process um, is still not really well understood. And I was particularly also interested in how that changes in aging as well. So my um, kind of uh, fellowship that I'm, I'm just about to commence now, um, funded by the Australian Research Council, is looking at, at kind of trying to look at all those factors together and developing a model for actually how that then um, affects people's ability to form and change their habits and then with the ultimate goal to see of how we can actually use that knowledge to design more effective interventions for helping people to change um, and improve their lifestyle for um, you know for long-term health. And that sounds terrific and I, I know you've also got um, or you're starting I think a collaboration with Amsterdam called the Habit Lab yeah, that's right. So the Habit Lab is headed up by Associate Professor Sana DeWitt in, at the University of Amsterdam. And um, she, they have some really um, innovative methods for measuring habit change, um, but mainly in, um, mainly in younger people and um, uh, looking at it from a neuroimaging perspective. And so we're collaborating together and um, you know, being situated now in Professor Karen Anstey's lab there's a lot of resources there with ageing and neurodegeneration and so working together to really looking at looking at these processes in the context of ageing. It sounds um, absolutely fascinating. But thank you very much, Sophie. I might um, move on to Alice now, Dr Alice Petty, I should say, who, um, who like me actually was living and working in London when the pandemic hit, but unlike me, managed to get back to Australia in March 2020 with her partner. Alice is from Sydney originally. She studied at the Australian National University in Canberra and also worked at the Queensland Brain Institute before starting with Neuro this year. Um, Alice, thank you. Your, your focus is schizophrenia and you developed a particular interest in the role of dopamine, a, a neurotransmitter or chemical messenger to our brains. Why, why schizophrenia and why dopamine? Yeah, look, uh, thanks for the question, Carol. So I guess my interest in schizophrenia began probably in my undergrad doing some psych courses. Um, and it was the idea of, I think, psychosis, really, that people could be experiencing a reality which was quite different to mine. And yet they would believe, as firmly as I do, that what I'm seeing uh, is the truth. So that idea of hallucinations, I think, drew me into schizophrenia in general. Um, but as I started doing my honours year in schizophrenia, my PhD, and now my postdoc, um, I've really understood, I think, you know, it's such a debilitating disorder, especially because it has an onset quite early on in life. 
it has approximately a 1% um, incidence rate worldwide, which is a huge number of people. Uh, so I suppose that's the motivation for me uh, committing to it now. And unfortunately, so the current treatments for schizophrenia are, are predominantly or almost exclusively actually antipsychotics. Um, and these are drugs which block uh, the transmission of dopamine in the brain. Um, and there's a lot of evidence showing that um, people with schizophrenia do show an increase in dopamine transmission um, and that therefore we would expect that antipsychotics would improve those symptoms. Um, I think the problem is that antipsychotics are very blunt instruments when it comes to manipulating dopaminergic activity. Um, and they have a lot of side effects, uh, detrimental metabolic side effects. They also fail to treat symptoms in about a third of patients. Um, so it seems that although, you know, normalizing this dopamine transmission is obviously a key part of treating aspects of schizophrenia, we really need to be able to do better than antipsychotics. And for the last 50 years or so, there haven't been any major improvements in those treatment options. I, I certainly know um, firsthand that, you know, families and, and loved ones of people who do experience schizophrenia would wholeheartedly agree with you. <laughs> Okay, so um, I believe you developed a particular model for studying the role of dopamine in schizophrenia. You actually repurposed a genetic construct developed for Parkinson's disease. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, so I suppose there are two sides of the, the dopamine coin. So in Parkinson's, you have uh, too little dopamine in the midbrain and striatal regions of the brain, uh, which contributes to the symptoms. And in schizophrenia, you have the inverse problem. So too much dopamine in those regions. Um, so we were lucky enough to be gifted uh, a genetic construct, which was developed at Lund University in Sweden, uh, which was designed to, as a therapy for Parkinson's patients, which is designed to increase uh, levels of some enzymes, which are really crucial for the synthesis of dopamine. So where they were intending it for use as a treatment, we give it to otherwise normal healthy uh, animals, rats in this case, to increase dopamine levels beyond normal levels to what we would consider to be replicating aspects of the schizophrenia neurobiology. Golly, okay. <laughs> and I know you've also done some work with fruit flies. How does that translate to human beings? Yeah, look, uh, fruit flies is obviously a slightly longer bow than, uh, than rodent yeah. models. I mean, I think, you know, even in the preclinical studies that we do, we know that we can't replicate the complexity of a human disorder, and especially not one which, you know, as far as we know, might be uniquely human, like schizophrenia. We, we can't assess whether rats can experience psychosis. Um, so I think the power of animal models uh, is to replicate some aspects of neurobiology, uh, which are inspired by findings from the clinical population and then obviously in animals, we have a little more flexibility about looking at um, molecular mechanism, what goes wrong and how we might normalize that as well. Okay, and I, I think more latterly, you've started to look at the role of inflammation in the brain in schizophrenia, particularly the midbrain, I think. Yes, that's right. So yeah, in my work here at Neuro, which I've just started, uh, we're lucky enough to have access to a brain bank. So we get a lot of post-mortem tissue from um, both healthy people and from people who lived with schizophrenia. Um, and we can use that tissue to look in the midbrain and other regions at neuroinflammation, which is appearing to be quite a, um, a critical factor in the pathology of this disorder. Um, and what's really interesting is that we start to see this clustering of patients so that some people who had schizophrenia um, show this increase in your inflammation and some people show quite normal healthy control levels of inflammation so we're getting this kind of subgroup division between this um, group of patients which is really interesting and we're trying to figure out whether neuroinflammation is related to the dopaminergic dysfunction um, and whether there might be you know potentially new uh, targets for uh, novel therapeutics which would be wonderful thank you Alice. All right, um, we might move on now to um, last but by no means least, uh, Dr. Aidan Cashin. So Aidan uh, is from Avoca on the New South Wales Central Coast and was actually lucky enough to study in Norway, the US, Canada, and at Oxford as part of his PhD in the days when one could still do that. 
Um, he's recently married and the couple is expecting a baby. Congratulations, Aidan. And um, like Sophie, before moving into research, you were also working on the clinical side uh, as an exercise physiologist, but now you research chronic pain. So what, what's the difference between chronic pain and acute pain? It's a, it's a great question. And simply put, when we talk about acute pain or chronic pain, we're simply referring to how long people have been experiencing symptoms for. So acute pain would be pain experienced for up to six weeks whereas chronic pain would be pain experienced from 12 weeks onwards. Okay, so it's purely duration, not, not severity. Yeah, simply when we talk about it, it's just all about duration. An acute episode of pain could be incredibly severe, as can a chronic episode. Okay, and, and what made you move uh, from the clinical to the research side? Yeah, so for me, I guess my story is a little bit similar to Sophie. I, I was working clinically, and some of the questions which kept arising Day to day really made me want to learn more and research seemed to be a real viable option to understand that. So I guess a bit of context, I was working um, as an exercise physiologist in a lot of different private clinics and mainly seeing people with, with chronic conditions, but particularly people with chronic pain conditions. And I found working with these people was particularly rewarding, but also quite challenging because pain is a really fascinating, but incredibly complex and unpleasant experience and one thing about pain which is particularly interesting is that many things can influence it which means as a clinician we have many possible things to target to help someone live a better life and one of the things we used to do a lot in my practice I was working was provide exercise strategies for people to help them recover we'd prescribe some really specific exercises tailored made to the individual you know, targeting certain muscles and certain movements then we'd prescribe real general programs you know just going for a walk or engaging more in activities. And we'd find that people were recovering regardless of the, the specificity or the type of exercise we prescribed. And it really made me think, well, how are these treatments working? Like if both can be effective, there must be some underlying thing that we're missing. So fortunate for me, my clinical mentor was also an academic and he introduced me to one of his colleagues over here at Neura, uh, Professor James McCauley, who was also quite interested in understanding how treatments work for chronic pain. And I guess that's how I fell into to research. Yeah, so, so I guess now focusing more on the mechanisms of pain, right? And, and here at Neuro, you're part of the Centre for Pain Impact, where we do quite a few clinical trials. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so the Centre for Pain Impact is relatively new, but also really quite exciting. There's over 30 researchers who are actively researching Searching here at Neuro trying to help people with pain live a better life and the research that we do goes all the way to basic science research so using animals and rodent models all the way to implementation research where we are trying to change practice in physiotherapy clinics or in general GP clinics and we have conducted some really high quality trials particularly in the field of low back pain so investigating new and, and current treatments for back pain but one of the most interesting trials at the moment is actually for a really rare and I guess complex chronic pain condition called complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS. What I find particularly interesting about this trial is it started um, recruiting or planned to start to recruitment during COVID. And as you can appreciate that imposed lots of challenges. So as a result, the trial went entirely remote. So it's now delivered by telehealth, which is really amazing. We can now target um, people to enter and join our trial throughout anywhere in Australia where previously we would have been restricted to maybe metropolitan areas. And this is a huge thing for people with CRPS who often don't have access to, to trials and to test these promising treatments. So we're quite pleased we can recruit anywhere from Australia from the comfort of people's lounge rooms. So that's that, really that sounds exciting. terrific. And I, and I know that's um, an intriguing but fairly rare condition, but I I also know that you've recently published uh, quite a significant piece of work on a far more common condition, mm. namely low, low back pain and the effect of muscle relaxants in terms of treating it. This is a very common treatment in, in Australia. What did you find? Yes, yeah, so uh, that review was just published in the British Medical Journal, which we were quite pleased we could finally share after lots of years of hard work. And we we're interested in, in muscle relaxants because as you said, they're the third most commonly prescribed medicine for back pain. 
And the recommendations from international guidelines are quite conflicted. Some people say you should prescribe them. Some people say you shouldn't. So what we did, we reviewed all the research um, which of research studies investigating muscle relaxants compared to a placebo or uh, a weightless control. And we were able to collect 49 uh, studies. And from those studies, we analyzed the results and we found that actually muscle relaxants aren't that effective at all. They do provide a small um, improvement in pain, but not something that a, a person would find meaningful. And they do come with an increased risk of experiencing an adverse event, so a side effect like dizziness or nausea. And we were really, really quite surprised because previous research had shown that these medicines were effective. But when we included all the most recent up-to-date evidence, it's actually far less clear than we first thought. And there's a real need for, for further research just to work out whether people should use these medicines or not. Okay, th thank you, Aidan. Um, now we've got some questions flooding in, but um, I've got two more up my sleeve. Um, actually two that I want to ask all three of you. So I'll just um, point the question to each of you in turn. In terms of our theme at Future Leaders, so uh, I know that you've all moved around a fair bit in your careers thus far. I know you either have, will be having, or would like to have children, and also that obtaining funding for research is getting harder and harder. So I'm wondering, how do you juggle all those factors in order to have a productive research career? Let, let's go back to Aidan first. Yeah, it's a great question. It is a real challenge. Research is incredibly competitive and grant funding is becoming more and more rare I think one feature which is really helpful to keep you in the game, so to speak, is having support and having support, not just from your family unit, from your immediate family or your partner, but also from your research group and the research environment that you're, you're within. So for myself, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by some really, um, I guess, generous and encouraging mentors, as well as a really productive and enthusiastic research group. So that was, is really helpful but also support from your environment being Neura. Neura is a fabulous place to conduct research from because we have support in terms of IT. If our computers um, go wrong, we have support in terms of trying to apply for funding and we have support through communicating our research to people who, who actually matter. So we're, we're very fortunate for that. So some of the secrets of success. Um, Alice, what about you? Yeah, look, it's a good point. I think... Um, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly early, early career researcher, and I feel like I haven't been up against it in terms of, um, you know, for instance, this is my first year applying for big grants through the NHMRC. But looking ahead, talking to postdocs in uh, the group that I'm in now and in previous groups, it just seems like a, a never ending stressful cycle of applying for funding, uh, which has, you know, minuscule success rates, really. And, um, you know, living in stress and on tenterhooks for the rest of the, the time, really. So I'm not sure. Uh, look, it's very tough. And for me, that has meant that I have applied for things overseas. For instance, I have this fellowship um, to go back to the UK, actually, maybe foolishly at the start of the year. Um, and I think that that's a real shame for Australian science, which could be, uh, you know, it's really something that we should encourage here. And I hope that, you know, I will come back after after my fellowship of two years or so. And um, I really look forward to engaging in scientific, uh, you know, the scientific community again here in Australia, which I think has such potential. So I really hope that, um, well, I'm not sure what the solution is apart from a whole lot more money in terms of science funding, uh, but I hope that there are options, especially for early and mid-career researchers. Your, your timing might be very good in terms of going back to the UK. <laughs> All right. And Sophie, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I would echo what um, Aidan and Al said. I think that having a, a really strong support network is really important. I agree with Aidan on that. I think um, the family network, like home support is, is helpful wherever that comes from. Um, and then, um, yeah, mentors and having supportive institutions like Neuro is really helpful. I think for myself, the other thing that's helped is to be, especially with since, um, you know, having kids as well, being very strategic about what I'm focusing my energy on, um, you know, how I'm spending my time working on being kind of as efficient and putting the 
the emphasis on kind of the really core important um, research goals has been helpful for me. Um, and then um, I think that that then plays into the positives of having, you know, if you have a family as well, um, you, you have to finish at the end of the day and then unswitching and engaging in other aspects of life. It actually does help to get new ideas and things that come to you when you're not focused in staring in front of a screen. So I think that can be the upside of actually um, having that, uh, the, the, the demands within your life that aren't just research focused. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a difficult funding environment. So I think being able to persevere and having a thick skin and taking all, you know, the, that knowing that it's just part of the process, I guess, of having, having to put in a lot of grants, you know, and maybe it shouldn't be that way, but knowing that it is and everybody experiences that. So just being able to persevere. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like you've got your strategies worked out in terms of being efficient and effective. Okay, so um, my last question for each of you, um, again, I'll, I'll throw it to each of you in turn. Through your research, what, what is your end game? What is it you want to achieve for humanity? Uh, let, let's go to Alice first this time. Sure. Uh, yeah, look, it's a, it's a big question. I think obviously uh, my priority is uh, improving outcomes for people with schizophrenia, if at all possible. Um, you know, ideally, we would like to research ourselves out of a job, if it comes to that, I'm sure there'll be other challenges to face. Uh, I don't think it's going to come as a big eureka moment. Unfortunately, science doesn't seem to work that way. Um, but rather more methodical incremental additions to, you know, the knowledge basis that we have. So I suppose I, I would like to contribute my, you know, my small part in understanding you know, understanding the brain, both when it's healthy and when things go wrong. And I hope that I can contribute some useful information, some useful knowledge, and that we can pool that with, you know, national and international researchers who are working, you know, coming at the same problem from different angles and maybe get a greater understanding of the brain when it's working well and what happens when it goes wrong. So I think that's my... Uh, sounds good to me, actually. I, I know one of the things that many people don't realise is that every publication that you guys work on is actually a brand new piece of knowledge added to the global bank of understanding about a particular disease. Yep. So um, thank you. Um, Aidan, what about you, your end game? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so for me, a lot of my research is with back pain and unfortunately for people with back pain, there's not many effective or safe treatments available. And it's a real problem because uh, back pain is common. One in five people at any one time will be experiencing an episode. So my end game would be to help develop new and effective treatments for people with back pain so they have better outcomes. And I guess similar uh, to what Alice said, my small part of that could be helping to understand how current treatments work. Once we can identify the mechanisms or how things work, then we can adapt them to have better effects and be more useful for other people. I'm with you being a back pain sufferer. <laughs> So, all right. And Sophie, what about you? Um, so I guess, uh, um, I mean, it may change a little bit over the over the point of the career, but right now I feel like one of the big um, uh, achievements that I'd like to see happen would be that the um, all the life expectancy gains that we've made, um, say, in Australia over the last few decades, actually see those extra years lived in dis um, disability and dementia free and to do that actually getting to a point where we're able to harness the power of um, you know good health and good lifestyle and other environmental factors to perhaps delay the actual cognitive decline that you see with something like with different, different dementias to a point where it's really happening very late in life or, or maybe you know you're dying of other causes first and um, to do that, um, I'm, you know, my, my contribution could be towards um, helping to clarify um, some of the um, questions around the mechanisms and the, the, the dose needed and, and how that might be different for individuals. So we get to a point of kind of personalised medicine for that and then using what we know about the science of behaviour change to really create what could be like really effective interventions for people to support them to make those changes in their life. So they're really clear on what those changes are and how to actually 
implement that um, so that we can kind of all live healthy, happy, cognitively healthy lives. Yeah, it's, it's all about um, getting that health span now to equal the lifespan, isn't it? Yes, yes exactly. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to turn my attention now to other people's questions. Um, just give me a moment to scroll up here. Okay. Um, let's see, where might we start? Um, in, in today's Australian newspaper, there's an article stating that people living with mild cognitive impairment could know five years in advance whether they are at risk of developing Alzheimer's. Are you aware of this and what are these developments? I might throw that one to Sophie again. Um, I haven't read that article, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by the right. new headline. Um, but certainly I think um, mild cognitive impairment is a group. So this is a group of people who might be showing some declines in um, or, or objective declines in cognition according to um, uh, cognitive test results, but they aren't showing, um, you know, uh, changes in everyday function. So still functioning fine, but they have noticed that there's cognitive change and it's been detected on, on tests. And um, this is a group now that, that are very keen to take part in research, which is great. And these people are at, at a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. But not everyone with, with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, will actually go on to develop Alzheimer's. And so trying to understand um, what, what is it about um, people who, who don't then go on, like how can we actually support those people who are at risk to maybe not go on to develop Alzheimer's? So I'm not sure about what this new um, progress is, but certainly this is a field that is rapidly evolving and I think is a, is a really, um, it's, a, it's a good target for early intervention for actually kind of reducing risk of, of dementia. All right, th thank you. Um, question for Alice. Do you envisage possible new medicines for schizophrenia that target inflammation rather than current antipsychotics, which restrict dopamine? Mm. Yeah, look, it's a very good question. Um, I think, in fact, so I am fairly new to the field of neuroinflammation, um, and I have a feeling that uh, some neuroinflammatories have been trialled as adjuncts to antipsychotics and to other treatments with schizophrenia. How successful they've been, I'm not sure. They certainly haven't replaced uh, the dependence on antipsychotics, which is pretty common for schizophrenia. I think... Um, Part of what we want to figure out is, you know, if there is, for instance, an association between neuroinflammation and dopamine dysfunction, sort of which one comes first? You know, if we deal with the neuroinflammatory um, issues, is that going to normalize dopamine? And then does that have to happen in a critical window of development, uh, developmental, um, you know, ontogeny of these systems? Because there are critical windows, um, adolescence is one that might be uh, very useful for our intervention in schizophrenia. And uh, there are quite a few um, studies that have trialed intervention now. As far as I know, none of them have successfully prevented onset or uh, attenuated symptoms in a, in a uh, long-term way. But I think uh, that potential for intervening, whether it's on neuroinflammation, whether it's on dopamine dysfunction, uh, you know, any sort of novel target that we can try, I think will be an interesting, you know, it'll be very interesting to see what those drugs can do in clinical populations. Thank you. Um, Aidan, a couple here for you. I think I might even know the answer to the first one, but I'm going to let you answer it. Um, that's most unusual. Um, are you still recruiting for the uh, chronic regional pain syndrome trial? Oh, great question. Thank you for asking that. We are. We are still recruiting. Um, the trial's been underway for the last six months and we've had a really nice interest so far and a few people have completed the program. So if you're interested, um, contact Neuro. I believe our website is the Neuro website slash memoir. Um, so if you're interested, yeah, reach out. That'd be fabulous. So if you know someone, please pass it on. That'd be, it'd be great. Okay, I did know the answer to that one. <laughs> and, um, a double-barreled one for you then. Is, is there research on long-term use of pain medication? Oh, yeah, another great question. So there are for certain medications, but not for all. Uh, so, for instance, when we did our review on muscle relaxants, there was no evidence for long-term use 
uh, in both either acute or chronic low back pain. But there, are, there is evidence emerging for long-term use of opiate medications. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, it's uh, something which is not recommended, unfortunately, due to issues with dependency and some other really serious adverse events. Thank you. Uh, this, is a, this is a doozy, um, uh, probably for um, anybody to answer. I, I might give you each a go. Um, with the federal government cutting funding for research, do the panelists notice a direct brain drain effect on the industry, either with promising researchers leaving the country or leaving the field entirely? Sophie, what do you think? Um, so I think the answer to that is yes, um, unfortunately. Um, it is a constant discussion of conversation among researchers about, you know, um, having to consider leaving, um, going into industry and other fields um, up until COVID, also taking opportunities overseas. Um, so yes, it, it's a real issue. And I think, um, you know, it, we are getting more creative about, you know, looking for other research funding sources. I think people who work in research really care about it and really, you know, most of us really, really want to stay in research and, you know, love our career. So we look for other opportunities and, you know, having, you know, Neura having um, donors as well is fantastic because you're not just relying on the government. But the reality is the government does make up the majority of the funding for research in Australia. And so when they cut funding, it does have a big impact. Um, so yes, this is a, it is an ongoing issue. Alice, any additional thoughts? Yeah, look, I absolutely agree with uh, what Sophie said. I think I mean, obviously, I'm taking advantage of the brain drain by, um, you know, heading back to the UK, uh, simply because, you know, you apply for things all year round, whatever you can find, and um, uh, you sort of take what you can get, really. Uh, and it's a real shame that Australia is not funding, especially um, uh, for my purposes, things like quite fundamental neuroscience. So where it's sometimes easier, I think, to get access to funding if you've got a real, a very tight clinical link, for instance. Um, but if you're doing very basic fundamental neuroscience, like what I'm doing, looking at molecular mechanism, um, it can be quite tough, I think, which is a real, um, it's a real shame because even the, the clinical studies and the clinical trials, they're all based on these findings about really key uh, molecular mechanism. So I think if we ignore that basic science side of understanding the brain, uh, we're going to be left in the lurch in a couple of years, probably, with a limited understanding there, which would be a real shame. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, research findings sit at the end of a, you know, research findings that translate, if you like, into direct benefits for consumers sit at the end of a long continuum, don't they, which starts with basic research. They don't just kind of pop up by themselves. All right, um, Aidan, any, any other thoughts from you on this issue? Yeah, I guess the only other addition I would add is that it seems that a lot of the gaps are around for early career, mid-career researchers. And that's a real, uh, real problem because people are finishing PhDs and if they don't have support from maybe other projects ongoing or from uh, places like Neuro or donations, they are, are lost. And they're lost to research, unfortunately, because the, the gap between obtaining an investigator grant from early mid or mid career researchers up to five years post PhD, and that's just not a sustainable uh, system for someone. Yeah, I, I remember reading this is quite a few years ago, and I guess you guys can tell me if it's if it's got worse. I suspect it has, but um, Someone told me quite a few years ago that researchers these days, um, whether early to mid-career or, or more senior, will spend at least 60% of their time applying for money, applying for grants. Does that, that people are nodding, yeah. <laughs> okay, we might leave that one there. Um, oh, we've got a little bit, little bit more time, so I'll take a couple more. Um, uh, thank you very much of the questions that people have posted. Um, perhaps back to Sophie on this one, and, and Aidan, you could chip in as well. What are the main habits that should be changed apart from changing lack of exercise to exercise? Ah, that's a very good question. And um, some, 
some kind of, I guess, aspects of lifestyle have been better clarified than others. So, um, yep, so you're absolutely right, physical activity. Um, alcohol, redu reducing alcohol intake to kind of very kind of low levels um, and uh, smoking cessation is an obvious one. Um, but then uh, diet is one which has really got a lot of emerging evidence. So there's new evidence um, of a particular diet, which is kind of a small modification of the Mediterranean diet called the MIND diet, um, which has uh, been shown to be associated with good cog um, kind of slowing cognitive uh, decline. Um, so that's promising and then in terms of other aspects of lifestyle that's been investigated are uh, the role of social so there's a lot of um, initially anecdotal evidence and then now some emerging evidence that you know social connection um, and it is really important um, for, for cognitive health and then also good maintenance of mental health as well so depression gives you a, a higher risk of, of subsequent dementia um, and, and the interesting thing, I think, as well, is that understanding how all these tie together. So they're not, they don't happen in isolation. So if you have, you know, physical activity that you do socially, um, and then that reduces your risk of dementia, they all, there's a lot of interactions there, I think, that we still need to understand and unpack. Um, and so there's, I guess that just shows the complexity of it, but the positive element is that there are actually a lot of factors that are emerging as being promising, but we just need more research to really add the kind of um, level of, of evidence that we could, you know, give a kind of prescription, I guess, about some of those lifestyle, like we're getting closer to being able to give a clear prescription about physical activity, for example, but we're further away when it comes to some of these other aspects of lifestyle. Yeah, so, so the greatest evidence base at the moment is for exercise, right? Yeah, exercise, um, alcohol um, reduction and smoking would be the strongest. But um, I think the MIND diet is definitely gaining traction. And then, yeah, some of these other ones I mentioned, I think that time will will show that they are important, but it's it's um, building up that, that evidence that still is underway right now. Yeah, understood. Um, Aidan, anything you want to add to that in turn, I guess it's harking back a bit to your past, but as an exercise physiologist, but um, anything you want to add? Yeah, it's helping me relive my glory days. Uh, <laughs> I guess one of the big things with um, exercise or physical activity is not getting too overwhelmed by the idea of exercising. It can be as simply as reducing how much time you spent sitting or being sedentary, as we'd say, say, you know, the more time you can spend up and about, whether it's walking or just limiting your time in front of the couch or a screen is, is just as important as, you know, engaging some formal exercise activity. Okay. I just, I just had to smile. There's a question that's just come in. I wondered if there's been any study into the effects of the weather on people with dementia. So I think any answer to that one? Ah, oh, well, that's a good question. I don't know if it's the weather specifically, um, but certainly, you know, the, the outside environment, um, I think there's a lot of general benefits in terms of um, um, just trying to think how I would describe it. So, for example, I know that certain latitudes you can have some um, types of neurodegenerative disease are more common, like, for example, multiple sclerosis is more common in um, parts of the world where you have longer uh, kind of darker winter, win winters and less sunshine. Um, and, but that, I think, comes more from, um, uh, from very early on in life or maybe, you know, even what, what's happening um, when you're still, uh, someone's still um, before they're born. So... I think that it's a really good question because um, the how the environment, the sun, vitamin D, how that might affect um, a range of aspects of physical and cognitive health is really valid. Um, and I know there's a lot of research going on right now about people who have Alzheimer's looking at how the environment actually affects um, their function and um, 
And I think that it plays into kind of mental health, the environment, how secure and, and happy, whether the environment sparks memories, if there's a whole lot of factors that can influence on quality of life when it comes to environment. And I, I do think that um, potentially being outside and the, the weather may have some impact on that, but I'm not sure if that's been um, ex you know, explored enough yet. Okay, we, we gotta <laughs> watch, watch this space. Um, okay, I think we're, we're kind of running out of time. Um, I might take this last question, if that's okay. Uh, what reasons would you offer to convince the public to support Neura? over other research institutions. Um, I've been with Neuro now for must be nearly nine months. So perhaps if I share with you the things that have struck me in that time, although obviously I have a lot more to learn. Um, there are 33 or 34 different research groups here at Neuro covering, uh, as you can probably tell by the diversity of our panelists today, a whole range of areas of great relevance, uh, particularly of great relevance as we age, but also of great relevance to mental health, spinal cord injury, um, et cetera. I have been uh, so impressed by the collegiality and the collaboration between these very diverse uh, areas of neuro. I think that creates an intellectual climate um, as I said, with a diversity that I really have not experienced before and which you've heard Alice and Aidan and Sophie talk about in terms of how that really nurtures their careers. Um, the other thing that's really struck me, although obviously Alice quite rightly has emphasized the importance of basic research, is just how much research at Neuro actually leads quite quickly to uh, quite practical and, and applied uh, benefits for the consumer. So um, from my point of view, though, those are two of the, um, of the great pluses in terms of supporting Neuro. But um, look at this stage, I, I think I do need to wrap us up. Um, my thanks to all three of you for inspiring us about the future of science and the problems that you're going to solve for us. Um, and um, Thank you very much for attending this first uh, NeuroTalks webinar. Please uh, help me thank Aidan, Alice and Sophie for their time and expertise and their very brilliant careers that stretch ahead of them. Look out for your follow-up email, which hopefully should come tomorrow. And I hope you will join me again for the next NeuroTalks. Goodbye for now. <laughs>